sheets. Yeah. 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 Okay. And there are models, yeah. Well, Sorry, I do have two questions. Um, well, one is on, um, on the strength of the vortices uh, when the uh, flow velocity is uh, in the chain. Um, as the velocity um, in, in your movie uh, that you shown at near the beginning, uh, the strength of the vortex become strong as the mm -hmm. flow velocity um, large. But um, after uh, slowing slowing down, the velocity is slowing down. Uh, I I, I saw that um, the strength of the boat scene become uh, more more increased after a bit of mm -hmm. going down. So uh, is there any um, phase difference between the, the velocity and the strength of the boat is created? Mm -hmm. a, a what? A, say that the, the last part again. A... Uh, phase difference between the uh, velocity uh, and the strength of the boat is created. Yeah, I guess there is. I have not investigated that, but but and also that vortex will help close the valves, right? So it has to be kind of stronger at the end when the velocity goes down. But yeah, there 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 is a phase difference. I yeah, I didn't do the the correlation, but yeah, the vortex becomes stronger as the velocity starts slowing down. The second question is mm -hmm. that, uh, I don't know much about biomechanics, but um, how do you use um, this kind of simulation for the cl clinical uh, applications for you um, when the doctor see, um, diagnose the uh, patients and how do you uh, use this kind of information uh, at the hospital? Well, it's, it's under research right now, so um, we believe that blood flow has a, a lot of information that we are not tapping right now and that we are not seeing because people usually don't look at the vortex formation and stuff like that. But that if we start looking into it, we are going to see that perhaps we can um, not only help the diagnosis because the diagnosis is there, but perhaps device better strategies to stabilize flow so that the disease does not progress. And then you can also, another thing that you can do is there are certain drugs that modulate, for instance, how the um, left ventricle contracts and expand, whether it does it, you know, faster or slower, you know, modulates the contraction. And so by doing numerical analysis, you can simulate what would happen in the patient and whether that's a better situation or a worse situation. And right now it's done on a trial and error basis. Like, you know, you come up with, like your doctor determines that you have, for instance, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then, yeah, they might wait a little bit, but then you become symptomatic and then they give you a drug and they see, well, does it work or not? And maybe it doesn't work and then they change the drug, right? But then perhaps if you know what the drug will do with emotion and you can simulate it, um, you can predict outcomes. Um, and so that's, that's the main idea. Yeah. Let's, let's thank you, Dr. Sergio Grant Gray, again for his uh, excellent speech. Okay, uh, next presenter will be Oscar Ara Perez. Oscar is the, what? Us, yeah, you. Next year, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Oscar is a PhD student at the University of Texas at Arlington, and uh, the topic of uh, these of his reports. Is, uh, what is uh, Oh, except my yeah. apology. I'm falling completely. No, you're <laughs> completely. You're fine. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, that's... Did I? There we go. Yeah, anchor. Oh, my camera's off. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then, and then turn the screen. So it's going on. Um, are they both? The same? Okay. Uh, do I start? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can uh, y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good uh, Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. My name is Oscar. No, I cannot hear you. You cannot hear me. Okay. Let me let me see. Like... No, I cannot hear you through here. I can't. Okay. Oh, great. I cannot hear. Oh. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Hear me? Okay. Yeah. What's the way? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay, uh, I am sharing the screen. Okay. And there's this thing. Hello, uh, my name is Oscar Alvarez. Uh, I do I introduce myself? Uh, I work with Dr. Liu. Um, at the U at UTA at University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, today I'll be talking about what is Leutex, Leutex in a in a more broad sense rather than a more technical or uh, physical sense. It's more of the idea of what Leutex is. So uh, the first question that we we ask is is what is a vortex? So let's ask what a vortex is. Let's ask Google what a vortex is. Uh, Google says, uh, in the dynamics of fluid, a vortex is a fluid that revolves around the axis line. Uh, that's a good definition for um, a vortex, but uh, what, does that, what does that mean? Uh, well, let's look at some pictures of some vortex vortices. I just Googled images of uh, vortex and these are the top results. I could scroll more and more and these are just what a vortex looks like to not me, but Google, the internet, the world. Uh, it, what it, it, a vortex is supposed to look like, what a vortex is. So, um, well, what is vortex? I think uh, in the beginning, uh, when we tried to define what a vortex is, uh, we uh, we found vorticity, and it's defined as the curl of flow vel velocity. And here's the formula for vorticity, um, where and uh, how did I put this here? Okay, <laughs> uh, so vorticity. That's that's kind of the first try at what a vortex is. And uh, it took off pretty well. In 1858, Hemmelholtz introduced vorticity filaments or tubes where vortices are defined by small vortice tubes where the strength of the vortex is represented by the magnitude of the vorticity tensor or vorticity vector. Since then, scientists like Lamb, Safman, Nish, Wu, et cetera, have been using vorticity to define a vortex. Or in other words, in attempts to methodically define a vortex, scientists used vorticity when defining what they believe to be a vortex. You can find examples to this day that define a vortex line as a streamline that at each point is parallel to the vorticity vector. Well, this is a misconception. They're defining a vortex line using vorticity. Well, Let's talk about Leotex. Leotex is a systematical or mathematical definition of local fluid rotation, just rotation. 
Well, okay, rotation, that's cool. What about shear? Well, what is, what is shear? Uh, here's some basic uh, solid mechanics uh, about shear. You kind of just have, uh, let's say, two plates, and then you move the top one, and it, this causes shear strain. Uh, so if I have like this solid block, a finite block of, of stuff, this is kind of what shear looks like. Well, let's look at a fluid. If I take a layer of fluid and I stack the layers on top of each other, like in the middle of a canal or or the boundary layer here across a plate, you can see shear starting to build as uh, the fluid goes in one direction or the plate goes in the other direction. So this is shear. This is another uh, image of shear. Uh, so you get the idea of what shear is in a, in a fluid. Um, Vorticity uh, is what we say is, is contaminated by shear. It's a, it's a vector-based vortex identification method, just like Liutex, except vorticity contains shear. That's why we say it's contaminated by shear, because it contains shear. That means when you calculate and use vorticity as a vector or its magnitude, you are also representing the shear that is occurring in the fluid. If vorticity is greater than zero, then shear and or rotation exists. And the or is important because that means you can have shear or rotation. Uh, and we're talking about um, uh, a vortex. So shear can exist with no rotation. So let's look at the boundary layer, right? Here's a boundary layer example where you have the velocity distribution here, the fluid, and it starts flowing. And look near the boundary layer. This is a, a location of very, very high shear stress. And um, as we go further away into the boundary layer in the turbulent region, uh, you start to see vortices, little vortices and stuff. But here, there's a lot of shear, but not very many vortices. As we get as close as possible to the wall, there's not a lot of vortices. It's just, you know, a fluid sticking to the, to the wall. Uh, you will have vorticity here. But you can see by this diagram that there's no rotation happening. It's just shear. There's no rotation. There's no uh, what we think of a vortex happening there. So uh, when we're talking about a vortex, and I Google an image of a vortex, uh, I did not post these images onto Google Images. Uh, Dr. Liu did not put these images onto Google Images. We did not upload these images and have them all over the websites and all over the world uh, as as a vortex and, and and put them up here for Google to find them as a vortex. Well, when we look at these images of, of a vortex, what do we see? It's not it's not this, right? You don't think of a vortex as this. You can't you you don't see this and say, hey, that's a vortex. None of these really kind of look like that at all. What do we actually see here? We're actually looking at rotation. All of these is just rotation. Not that, rotation. So let's ask Google again, uh, what is a fluid vortex, right? We're just asking, we're still wanting to know what a vortex is. Well, uh, the third result of Google uh, comes up with the um, University of NM, I guess Northern Michigan, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but this is this is the third result. And uh, it says, a vortex is typically defined by a region in the fluid of concentrated vorticity. Now, vorticity, it's kind of like, you know, you think, oh, a vortex. Well, that's the problem is that when we think of vorticity, we think of vorticity not a vortex, we think of vorticity. Uh, this is wrong. Uh, vorticity contains the shear that we talked about that is not a fluid. This is not a vortex, right? But uh, vorticity contains it. And we see that in um, even in Google and in, in, in the open world and in real life, when new people are being introduced to this field and and uh, 
and are just beginning uh, that they could read this and be uh, led astray uh, to something that no longer is true. Uh, and I believe that it is our, res our responsibility as researchers of Leotex to change this way of thinking through education, which is kind of what we're doing here uh, through this conference. Um, Leotex represents the pure rotation in a fluid without contamina contamination of shear. A vortex is described as rotation. That's what we see it as. So let's look at the definition of a vortex again. A fluid that revolves around the axis line. We have this. This is known as the Leutex core line. Oh, the Leutex core line as we know it. The Leutex core line represents the axis of rotation of a fluid about which it rotates. It is unique. This means that there is only one representation of the vortex structure using this method. Thus, we can represent the unique vortex structure using the Leutex core line. Here are just some methods of uh, the method by hand that we use to find the Leutex core line uh, in our data. We have a boundary layer plate here in early transition. And uh, we just kind of do a cross section with the ISO surface. We take the gradients, it converges into the the max, local max of the the um, the data, the the grid, and we create a Leotex line. And here we have a segment of the Leotex core line, or what we're researching to find the Leotex core line. And here's an example uh, where we have a ton of vortices, a lot of vortex structures. Uh, the ISO surface is drawn at some threshold, right? The rev that we see represents the vortex, but uh, these uh, structures within the ISO surface, these Leutex core lines, these um, these core lines, uh, they describe the vortex uh, independent of any threshold. It's more of just that's what they are, and we can see them going uh, rip in the center axis of rotation. So. They're spinning around this line. The, the, the fluid is rotating about the line there. Uh, we also have uh, the Leotex core. Leotex core uses Leotex line. Uh, so we the Leotex core is a vortex representation that is dependent on the Leotex core line. Uh, I describe it as a bunch of Leotex lines surrounding the Leotex core line at a scalar multiple of the local max value at the center where the core line is. So if we look at uh, this core line here, we can surround the core line with a bunch of Leotex lines, these here, and we have a different uh, visual representation of the vortex structure. And these are vectors here. It's not an ISO surface because you can see the change in magnitude of the uh, fluid uh, throughout the structure. It kind of gives it more volume. Uh, here's the Leotex core versus a Leotex magnitude. So uh, the seed for the Leotex core is right here at the center of this region. And uh, it generated this entire uh, uh, Leotex core. But if we look at, uh, uh, let's say, this outer value here uh, of the Leotex magnitude and just draw the ISO surface using that, this is the vortex uh, structure that we see. And you can see that we're missing a lot. We're missing uh, the whole leg of the hairpin connecting to the other legs and all that stuff. Uh, well, we could just decrease the ISO surface, right? Well, at which point do you stop decreasing, right? At which point do you do you stop changing the value where it represents uh, your vortex structure? Uh, and that's one of the problems with using the ISO surface is that it's threshold dependent depending on whatever uh, you feel like leaving it as. Uh, the Leutex core line is independent. Um, it is what it is. So uh, that's kind of what uh, the other presenters kind of had when they were doing the core. 
Uh, is that the end? That's the end. I don't have a lot. OK, thank you, Oscar. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, any questions? Any question? Yeah. OK, uh, if not, we can go to our next presenter. Uh, let's welcome Emron Hossein. Uh, Emron Hossein is a PhD student at the uh, University of Texas in Arlington, and uh, his topic is simulation by using one's latex uh, based subgrade model. Let's welcome him. It's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let me open my video, right? Yes. When you make sure you share the screen. Okay. I think maybe that one. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you please check? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, hello everyone. Uh, uh, good evening and good uh, good morning. I think good afternoon almost <laughs> uh, in the China or other South Asia or Asia. So my name is Imran Hussain. Uh, I'm from uh, University of Texas at Arlington, and I'm a student a student of uh, Dr. Liu Chao Kun. I'm uh, uh, presenting a large eddy simulation using Wang's Lutex based uh, subgrid model. So the outline of my presentation is that uh, uh, first I'll give some introduction of uh, uh, what uh, we did in that research work. I'll give some description of uh, turbulence modeling and what is subgrid stress model and I'll show our uh, results. And finally, I'll summary the presentation. So the first introduction is that, uh, so since uh, uh, I'll talk about most of uh, turbulence model here, uh, you know, the turbulence is uh, uh, so complex and chaotic in fluid motion. So that's why it's uh, uh, it's very challenging uh, to modeling in fluid dynamics. Uh, turbulence occurs at a wide range of scales and capturing all the details in a numerical simulation, so which is computationally impossible. Uh, therefore, uh, 
uh, to address this issue, we uh, model uh, subgrid subgrid stress model uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, predict uh, turbulence flow flows, which efficiently resolving the large scale motions. So uh, throughout this presentation, I will illustrate the key concept of subgrid stress modeling and its application to LES at the turbulent boundary layer. So we'll also uh, show the mathematical foundation. I uh, will give some uh, numerical implementations and the validation of our approach through computational results. And I will show comparison with experimental data with other uh, subgrid stress model. And additionally, I will highlight the significance of our findings and the application implication for practical engineering some applications. So what is turbulence modeling? Actually, I already uh, talked turbulence is the is apparent as chaotic motion in of the fluid flows. So in real life, we uh, we know that the turbulence flows are found in air flow over an aircraft wing cyclones. Water flows in rivers. Even you can see in the uh, graph, uh, it can be happen in the water trap. <laughs> so, so it uh, turbulence consists of many vortices, which is why it is important to understand the great importance of turbulence structure and their mechanisms. So, in fluid dynamics, turbulence modeling is the construction and uh, use of mathematical model to predict. Uh, the effects of turbulence. So, so you, you guess what the importance of turbulence already. So we'll talk about that turbulence modeling in the next uh, slides. So there are several turbulence models, um, each with its own level of accuracy and complexity designed for different flow regimes and applications. Some of the common computational methods are direct numerical simulation, uh, DNS, Reynolds average, uh, Nebier Stokes, we say it is RANS, and then large eddy simulation, LES. Uh, I can see the graph uh, uh, that shows a little bit about uh, laminar flow, uh, transition, and then turbulent. Uh, in the turbulence, you can see more uh, vortices, could be more uh, uh, complex structure, vortex structure. Uh, next, uh, what is direct numerical simulations? Direct sim numerical simulation is a computational fluid dynamics technique used to simulate and simulate and anal analyze fluid flows by solving Navier Stokes. The equation directly without any modeling. And so Navier Stokes equation discretized uh, in time and space to solve numerically. So here in direct numerical simulation, it resolves the largest to smallest scales of turbulent motions. The problem is that uh, in DNS, which is very computationally cost, uh, the cost is very high and you know the current mesh size applied in uh, direct numerical simulation which is around 60 uh, million gits so you can uh, understand what how it can be uh, computational uh, computationally very highly cost uh, so we uh, the numerical methods is uh, the sixth order compact scheme for special uh, derivatives in the stream-wise, span-wise, and wall normal direction is used. In the span-wise direction, the spectral method is used in the place of compact scheme. Fourier transformation is adopted to calculate the derivatives in the span-wise direction. To eliminate numerical oscillations caused by central difference scheme, a special uh, filtering is applied, and we also uh, uh, here it is implicit uh, sixth order in compact scheme for the space filtering and third order Ronge-Kutta method is used 
for the time integration. So that numerical methods applied for DNS case. Next, I'll show a little bit about the flat uh, uh, flat plate. You know already uh, the last presentation Oscar described a little bit about the uh, flat plate. So here uh, you can uh, I'll just uh, say uh, 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 the three layer uh, applied in uh, fl flat plate, which is important for our further uh, uh, slides to show the results and comparison. So the first layer is we can say viscous sub layer and then uh, buffer layer and we have turbulent region. So you can see that in uh, turbulent region we have uh, a lot of uh, bodices and uh, and sub viscous sub layer is nothing but it is is, is happen uh, uh, in uh, laminar flow and in the buffer layer we can see also uh, small vortices, uh, not like it as turbulent region. So next in uh, computational domain of the flat plate, this uh, domain we used in our uh, DNS case, uh, which is uh, in the flat plate flow, use the MAC number that is 0 0.5. We use uh, Renault uh, uh, number that is 1000 uh, for testing case. And you can see that in the X, Y, and G axis, uh, the X axis is stream wise, and Y axis is span wise, and the G axis we we uh, applied as one normal, where uh, we take grid number as uh, uh, 1920 times 120, uh, 128, and 241. So these grids are stressed in the normal direction while it is uniform in the stream wise and span wise direction. The wall boundary has adiabatic and non-slipping conditions, and the top boundary is set as a far field, and the outflow boundaries have non-reflecting boundary conditions. So the domain here, we given uh, X in, which is um, uh, X in the is, uh, um, is uh, 300.79, which represent the distance between the leading edge, edge and the inlet, and X L X, which is uh, uh, given uh, 798.03, and L Y S, uh, that is uh, 20, 22, and the wall normal, which is uh, 40, Mach number will uh, 0.5, Renault 1000. And TW, which is um, wall temperature, uh, this is 273. And T infinity, which is a uh, free stream temperature, again 273.15 Kelvin. Uh, here is one uh, uh, graph for DNS uh, flat plate. We just shows the vortex structure uh, of uh, DNS flat plate. You can see that the more you come up from uh, uh, 500 to 800 in X direction, the vortex structure became more complex. The next slide uh, I just uh, shows uh, directly from that. That is for LES case, but uh, I, I came here only because of uh, we can compare easily with the DNS case. Uh, we can use uh, we can use we used here the gears are eight times coarse than DNS, and the Dimension, which is 960 times 64, time 121. So you can see that there are less uh, vortex structure in X direction. The next, another case we used for LES case, uh, we, we used the grids are 32 times coarse than DNS, which is 900, 960 times 32 times 61. You can see that since we uh, reduced the uh, um, course, uh, uh, reduce the grid and see that the vortex structure still became even more smaller. So the next uh, one, we uh, know that Reynolds averaged Navier Stokes, which is RNs. RNs is time average equation of motion for fluid flows, uh, which is an instantaneous quantity uh, is decomposed into its time averaged and fluctuating quantities. So for an incompressible 
in uh, incompressible flow, the equation can be written as. So we can also this uh, equation can be derived from Navier Stokes equation. Uh, the range is less demand demanding because it introduces additional transport equations for turbulent quantities such as kinematic energy and viscosity. The next one, large uh, large eddy simulation. Uh, uh, large eddy simulation LES, which is proposed by Smagornsky in 1963. So in the LES case, uh, we can resolve the large scale eddies. And the small scales or less energetic eddies, which are uh, parameterized using a turbulence model. So there is a little, uh, uh, I mean, going back over the Reynolds, we can directly in RNs, we can uh, uh, we can uh, resolve all the uh, energy through the model, but in the LES, we can get the large eddies from the uh, uh, large eddies directly resolved and small eddies you can get from the model, turbulent model. So in the LES case, the computational cost is significantly less compared to the DNS. It is widely used in con engineering applications where resolving large scale turbulence structures is required for accurate results. So you can see that graph from the right side, the, uh, the first one, which is actual flow, flow field. Uh, we can see that both uh, large scales and small scales eddies. And whenever we apply for the alias case, we can take only or uh, large scale. And uh, in the LES case, we apply also the filtering. Uh, filtering, uh, the filtering equation is uh, Ey bar x equal to integration g times x minus cos e, u cos e, uh, uh, delta uh, cos e, uh, where g is the kernel and Ey bar is the resolvable scale part and Ey uh, prime is the subgrid scale part. So, and then you can see that the decomposition of energy spectra in LES, the total uh, energy spectra equal the result part and the modeling part, model part. The next, uh, uh, this is, uh, we also derived the uh, a filtered, uh, 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 filtered uh, through the neighbor Stokes uh, equations. So uh, that is the equation for the uh, uh, filter for uh, LES case. Uh, next, uh, subgrid scale modeling. So subgrid scale modeling is nothing but uh, uh, we just uh, get the uh, small eddies uh, using subgrid scale model. And uh, the small scale set is which cannot be adequately resolved on computational mesh. Those unresolved structure at the subgrid scales generate additional stresses that influence the flow dynamics. So these stresses need to be modeled in LES to accurately capture the impact of the smaller turbulent scales on the resolved flow. So subgrid stress modeling is essential for obtaining reliable results in LES simulation. So various models have been developed to approximate the effect of undissolved turbulence fluctuations. So you can see that graph for grid scales, the large scale one, and that small eddies, which we can get to the subgrid scales. There are uh, some uh, models in LES, which are Smagorinsky model, whale, whale model, and the Lutex model. <laughs> Magonsky model uh, is one of the first introduced and most widely used LES subgrid stress models. The linear relation between the eddy viscosity and the magnitude of large scale deformation tensor in the following form, that is nu t equal Cs uh, delta square S bar. So here nu t is the eddy viscosity and Cs is the model coefficient, and delta is a characteristic length scale often determined by the determined by the filtering width of mesh, and S 
uh, SIJ bar, which is represent the filtered rate of strain tensor. We also uh, 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 we also express that delta the length is the three direction uh, three direction time uh, to the power uh, one third. Uh, the model coefficient has different suggested values, but it is it usually adopts a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 value. And in the Smagonsky model, uh, there is one drawback drawback that is it overestimates the eddy viscosity under strong background shear. So it leads to a non-zero residual viscosity and shear stress at the wall. Next, well model. Well model is, uh, uh, is, is a subgrid stress model used in LES, which is just an extension of a Smagonsky model. Uh, the then the model is uh, uh, given the formula is new t that is rho del square delta square s uh, times uh, that is uh, the st strain rate of tensor uh, sig power d sigd uh, to the power three and half and to the uh, divided by uh, same the strain rate of tensor uh, 5 over 2 plus state tens of tensor over uh, to the power 5 over 4. And that is the uh, given all the length scale uh, and rate of strand tensor. In the well model, they uh, use the constant is 0 0.1 to 0 0.12. So that there are some benefits of well model, which is improves the prediction of subgrid scale turbulence, particular, particularly in wall bounded flows where resolving the near wall region can be computationally expensive. So next, our Lutex based model, uh, which is proposed uh, by uh, E. Kuen Wang in 2023. Uh, Lutex is not contaminated, contaminated by shear. The model is defined as nu t equal uh, c nu uh, delta square uh, r bar. Uh, that is uh, that R bar is the uh, lute, filtered luted magnitude and delta is the filtering length scale, uh, which is defined similarly as Magonsky model, uh, delta X, delta Y, delta Y to the power one third. And in the lutex based model, uh, you can take the uh, uh, constant uh, that is 0 0.032. So next, the law of wall, which is uh, uh, applied for our um, um, analysis of the results. So there is all given the uh, uh, law of wall uh, uh, algorithms and uh, uh, so the log law of, is defined by uh, u plus equal to one over k natural log y plus plus c plus. So y plus is the wall coordinates, u plus is the dimensionless velocity and so here the y plus is given uh, y u tau divided nu and u tau equal to given also root square of tau w over rho and u plus equal to u over u tau so that all the parameters uh, given here and here the bond carbon constant k k is the bond carbon constant uh, used for 0.41 and C plus is the constant, which is 5.0. Uh, next, I'm going through over our uh, results section. Uh, before the results, just uh, uh, we can show the log law for DNS. In the DNS case, uh, we use the grid size is that is uh, 1920 times 128 uh, times 241. So you can see that the viscous sublayer uh, in this region below five uh, wall units, the variation of U plus to Y plus is one proportion one, and Y plus is uh, less than five, and U plus equal uh, uh, Y plus. So you can see that in the viscous sublayer, both are equal. And the buffer layer, you can find five less than Y plus, less than 30. 
so u plus is not equal to uh, 1 over k natural log of y plus plus uh, c plus so you can see the graph the uh, dns case uh, which is log linear plot of time and spin wise average velocity profile in the wall unit so next our result sections uh, the uh, uh, first we can show the mean velocity distribution of dns flat plate we already show, shows the one and next there is another uh, mean velocity distribution of dns which is uh, compared with uh, uh, another resource uh, with the hussein and reynolds uh, you can see the dns curve uh, next in our uh, actual uh, results uh, uh, we can at the first we can take mean velocity of LES course grid and uh, 960 times 64 times 121 at stimulized location when x equal to 700 and when x equal to 800. So we can take uh, 2x direction when x equal to 700. Uh, you can see that the green one is. Um, a DNS case, the blue one is our uh, model LES, and the purple one is Smagonski model, and the black, uh, the black one is uh, the, which is not modeled. So in our case, you can see that the blue one is our uh, Lutex based uh, LES subgrid model, so which is pretty match with the DNS case compared with the other Smagonoski model and non-model. And same here in the X direction when 800, uh, you can see that uh, our uh, Lutex based model is pretty match with the DNS curve. Uh, next, we uh, took uh, uh, 960 times 664 times 121 and direction, uh, stimulus direction, x equal to 900 uh, still you can see that our model is uh, pretty uh, accurately with uh, very pretty match with the dns curve and compared to far better than smagoronsky and some uh, uh, non models les again the mean velocity of profile when uh, the les course grid is reduced to 962 uh, 60 times 300 32 times 61 and when uh, x direction is 700 still uh, we can say that uh, our uh, uh, lutex uh, subgrid model is uh, pretty good compared with other uh, uh, subgrid model so same here we can uh, uh, we can took uh, uh, a different case of uh, direction and uh, uh, dimension we can see that uh, uh, um, uh, again and again our uh, lutex based model work pretty well uh, um, compared with other uh, subgrid stress model next i also show the stimulus velocity profile uh, the blue uh, the blue one which is dns cased the orange is uh, our les and uh, the yellow one is uh, Smagonski model and the purple one is for uh, non-model. Uh, in the stimulus velocity profile, you can see that our uh, uh, the orange one, which is uh, uh, lutex-based uh, model. So still in the stimulus velocity profile, we can see that uh, our lutex subgrid model, uh, uh, which is uh, pretty similar uh, with the DNS curve. Similar one, we can take some other uh, data set. We can see that uh, um, our uh, uh, subgrid stress model work pretty well. The next I'll show some uh, slide for comparison between uh, um, difference model and our model. So for Smagonski model, uh, which uh, over predicts the eddy viscosity, the well model resolves the Smagonski model issues. 
but in the lutex based model does not over predict in eddy viscosity at the world uh, in that case you can see that the smogonski model is non zero residual viscosity and shear stress at the wall and well model the eddy viscosity is not zero but 0 0.1 in the lutex based model the eddy viscosity is strictly equal to zero at the wall so if you compare with the formula smogonski model is simple well model is complicated and you can see that the lutex based model is uh, pretty simple uh, and the constant also same here uh, the smogonski is 0 0.1 to 0 0.12 and well is uh, 0 0.55 to 0 0.60 and lutex based is 0 0.032 the next one, the CPU time for DNS and LES. Uh, you can see that gear size for DNS is uh, around 60 million. And we took uh, two cases of LES, LES1 and LES2. For the LES1, we can see that is only 700 million. And LES2, we find only 1 million. So mess is for DNS, which is fine gears. And LES1 is eight times coarse and LS2, which is 32 times scores. If you utilize, uh, you can see the uh, CPU utilization for the DNS case, which take two, two weeks. If you compare with the DNS case for the, in our LS case, which take only one to 1.5 days, which is 14 times faster than DNS. For the LS2 case, uh, you can, it will take only five hours, which is, 60 times faster than DNS. So there is one uh, engineering based application. The Reynolds numbers for the for such an engineering examples are generally uh, uh, which is uh, 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the power 9. So the number of operation required for DNS case, which is 10 Q, uh, 10 to the power 8 to the power cube, which is 10 to the power 24. It is impossible to do DNS with the current available computer. So you can see that how is it, it is uh, uh, computationally cost. So last the summary, uh, which is the, uh, the mean velocity from the mean velocity profile discussed above, it is clear that the lutex based model is more efficient. The lutex based subgrid stress model resemble the DNS profile, whereas no model case does not resemble due to lack of eddy viscosity. The formula of the lutex based model is similar to the Smagonsky model, but the Smagonsky model over predicts the eddy viscosity. And from the uh, analysis of the Born Karman law, it is evident that the new model performs better in turbulence boundary layer. Of the flat plate. Uh, the current study demonstrated the great uh, possibility of using the third generation vortex identification method of lutex to introduce uh, new models. So that all overall uh, my presentations. Uh, I just wanted just one second. Uh, 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 did you did I uh, just uh, did I skip the the lutex based model that time? Uh, that's sorry. Okay. So did I skip the one whenever I describe? Okay, let me just recap the lutex based model. I'm sorry, I'm taking a little uh, uh, one minute. So again, I'm just recapping uh, recap the lutex based model. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm done it. So the lutex based model is C nu del square R bar. So R bar is uh, nothing but the all uh, the uh, lutex components uh, square uh, 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 and that is. So I'm sorry, I thought I didn't explain that time well. So that's all my presentation. Uh, thank you for all of you for your attention. Uh, thank you for introducing us a new uh, subgrid model and uh, so uh...
do you have any questions and would like to discuss with Emron? Yeah, sure. And thank you very much for your uh, very wonderful and uh, um, interesting and research and very and, and, and very curious about um, this research. And the first, um, you you are showing the profile, uh, the profile of the group. Yes. Um, among uh, various uh, sub sub group scale models. Yes. Show that again. Give some more second. And yes, yes, yes. And uh, yeah. Other load load. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the DNS at uh, uh, near the free stream, uh, the velocities become uh, the, what one no, no one is by some reference value by approaching one. But um, other uh, regarding other cases, uh, the velocity is uh, is smaller than one. Is it uh, in the free stream? Uh, the, the profile uh, approaches to the um, Christian values or the same same Christian values. Uh, actually, uh, here we uh, try to comp uh, uh, comparison with uh, some other models. So so far we find that uh, uh, you know uh, the DNS case is very uh, predictable, right? So uh, from other works, you can see that our LES, uh, our latest LES is which is uh, in some case, which is very uh, 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 pretty match with that DNS case. Maybe I, uh, I'm sorry, maybe. Is the model From this, so the frequent value would be the, uh, be the same sample uh, on. Yeah, I can say that. We're in a look at that. Possible. You look back the last one. That means that the last one is a lot larger than the DNS. You look at look at that. Look at that. Okay. Like this. That's what I mean. You see that your log log is it's a large. The DNS is small. You, you see, that means the log log area is larger than DNS. DNS is uh, smaller. That means, uh, yeah. The, well, the, the general trend, if you um, use the, if you do the course simulation, yeah. uh, the log log profile, when, uh, the what, what, I'm going to say, um, um, the back constant uh, is higher than 5.2, 5, 5. but uh, 5.2, of course, higher becomes higher. Yeah, uh, some some people, um, what from what I remember, and some people say uh, this low grow becomes lower than this common uh, than low grow uh, if you remove uh, the subgroup scale models. So, is it the general trend or? The, uh, for doing doing the uh, core simulation, uh, loop loop more becomes uh, higher than the current loop loop. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not a lot. It's pretty new actually. Yeah. 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 And uh, that's not much fun. And I uh, think that the, the common, the yeah, one common coefficients uh, could be different by uh, different uh, people. Yeah, that, that's that's correct. So. The, some part is 0 0.5, 0 0.52, or 0 0.4. Yeah, that's different. Right? Where really it is uh, hard to judge which one it is a bad, but it is should be judging with with the expert. I think. Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah, that what we take. Uh, you can say that for the yeah, level of for DNS, DNS case. Right. You say we only use 60 million. We yeah. you cannot say it's right? As I said, yeah. it's like, it's like it's big, 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 big. It's different, but we are geometry is very thin. So 16 million is okay, I think, yeah. Compare with other DNS work or compare with some one kind of theory or with other, you know, DNS results, it's okay. Yeah, that's what we say, we support, yeah, to be okay. Then we, 
use this DNS as something like exact output. Then compare this use LNES with different model or with other model. So that's <laughs> okay. But we give the, the precondition that say DNS is correct answer. As you said, well, you may not. <laughs> it may not, yeah. This is just your final judges still by the X hand, I think, yeah. So the only thing we can say that we see as he assumes he has his exact solution, yeah. Yeah, the core of curiosity category yeah, sure, sure. or curiosity. Mm -hmm. And you um proposed um, the subgrid mode, a subgrid mode using the uh, UTP test. And uh, um that mutex the magnitude increased the um subgrid scale uh, subgrid viscosity is yes the viscosity. Yeah. Um my my um yeah, uh, on, yeah. question, question is that um that the sub subgrid um, in the original meaning, the separate uh, SDGS viscosity uh, correlated with uh, does not correlate with uh, shear stress, or you you just uh, re reflected you you just uh, expressed uh, the uh, rigid rotation rigid rotation apart to uh, the SDGS model, and you removed she shear uh, shear effects. Shear is completely, you know, get out. And yeah, the, uh, uh, energy, uh, the shear, uh, you know, produce uh, energy dissipation. But the, what the problem is that the, the shear mainly, mainly, they not, uh, you know, what, what we miss, we miss for the NES is the small size vertices, this rotation, really rotation. For the in the lamina, you know, uh, nail, there's no rotation, only shear. So the eddy viscosity is related to the rotation. Then we have viscosity. Well, when you talk about the shear, energy is, is uh, you know, not the loss, it's really true, but it's not caused by mu, it's caused by mu mu part of y. So, so yeah, of course they dis, uh, dissipated the energy, but not caused by mu. Here we talk about mu. I show you part of Y is not near the wall. They they get you know energy you know destroyed or something like that. But here we talk about model, we change the mu. That's the eddy viscosity. Eddy viscosity should be correlated to A or vortex, not the correlated to shear. So that's the concept. So smart trans model, it is correlated to shear. <laughs> As I said, it is a force of physics, against the physics. Does they get a contradiction? But people try to solve the problem. They try to use a wall function or like a wave. They try to, you know, solve this problem. But even occasional has a problem. Occasional has a problem because the epsilon it is zero near the wall. Then your Eddy viscosity become infinity, but in really in the real world, the, the eddy viscosity is zero. <laughs> so that's the, the all this, this I said, well, all this model just against the physics. Then they try to, you know, uh, repair that, that by introducing some more function. Well, it does not natural. New text is it's natural. They, it is zero in the sub layer. They bigger. Is in the not area and the, the buffer domain. There is zero in the wake. So, Dutex is a natural, you know, candidate for the subgrid model. I think, yeah, that's the reason you know, when I use it. Well, they don't need to adjust to anything. So, well, I still uh, don't, don't you know, agree with this one. We need to refine the subgrid model. That's what he's working and he's working. On the side of the yeah, but don't mix the shear. Shear means partial u part of y. Mu is the, we talk about any viscosity when we talk about this. Any viscosity is not natural viscosity. It's caused by rotation. So we need. A, yeah, yeah I, I'm not sh I'm sure if a doctor you have some uh, experience about that. Yes, you don't have. Problem, mm -hmm. Yeah.
uh, and, and you know, that's the case, don't mix them, right? She is still strong. The still you dissipate the, the energy. That, that's is for true. But this comes here, not by mu. Here we can find mu. Mu, yeah, mu is any of this concept. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, also. Yeah. Answering it's the question. I work this area for like 30 years. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Emra, again. And uh, we just move to our next presenter. Yeah. Yeah. You can use my computer. Hello. Um, you know, oh. my, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, test, 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 test. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, hello again. If you were here for my last presentation, there's some stuff. It. Uh, my name is Oscar Alvarez. I am part of Dr. Liu's team at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, I am looking for my presentation. Uh, it's with no. There we go. Um, Right now, I'm in collaboration with NOAA, or our group is in collaboration with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, hello? Can I? Oh, here it is. Get on. Um, uh, again, my advisor is Dr. Chokin Liu. We all know him. And Dr. Sim Aberson. He is my uh, point of contact in NOAA, Florida. Uh, and yeah, so hurricane visualization using Leotex. This is uh, the purpose of this work is to convert GRIB files into plot 3D files for hurricane vortex visualization and analysis. Again, this work was done in collaboration with the National Oceanographic uh, and Atmospheric Administration and the University of Texas Arlington Department of Mathematics. So the hurricane data uh, comes in what are called GRIB files. Grip files are a collection of self-contained records of two-dimensional data. They are used to collect atmospheric data, such as you know when hurricanes are occurring. The data is collected via satellite and sent down to Earth, where it is saved into GRIB data files. Uh, and it is used. This this GRIB format is used by most international meteor, meteor, meteorological centers. So it's it's a very common format, very common way to uh, read uh, weather data. So uh, the software and tools that I used to accomplish this uh, were of course the GRIB files, which have an index file, a control file, and the actual GRIB data file. Uh, one common uh, open source um, uh, package for visualizing these GRIB files are called Open Grads. Um, grib wgrib 2c which is a file that will turn the group files into readable text. I used Fortran, Ubuntu Linux with Windows, um, and I used TechPlot 360, but you could use Paraview for visualizing the Plot3D files. So here's an example of uh, the hurricane data from the group files. Uh, 
These are grid files for Hurricane Arthur, uh, and these are visualized using OpenGrads. So this is the OpenGrads software. You can see that this is just a two-dimensional, uh, what I call, uh, what is it called, slice of the hurricane. And as we go um, this way, like uh, like reading a book, uh, it's uh, the pressure is uh, increasing. So this is the uh, top of the hurricane, and then we go further down uh, to, to the lower part of the hurricane. And this is just the velocity. Uh, these figures are. Uh, oh, uh, they are like three D, but in planes. Right. So this is this is the two dimensional. It's the three. It's three D data. It's all down. Mm -hmm. And then this one's the top one, and this one's the bottom one. And they did. There's more, but this is just a few of them. These were provided by Dr. Sam Everson. So what's the plan? We need to translate the grid file data into a readable format. We need to extract the velocity and location data from the grid file data. Post-process the extracted data and calculate Leutex. Generate a plot 3D file for uh, visualization and then actually visualizing the files. How do we do this? We use uh, this uh, program that was created a long time ago by really good people uh, to read the grid file. And uh, the grid file is binary satellite data. So it's very proprietary. It's uh, it's you need you need to know a lot about it in order to translate it. So this program does it for you and it turns it into text. Uh, we need to filter that text and extract the data using, uh, well, I use a, sh a shell script uh, that uses grep, which is uh, a way to filter text, and then write that data to a new file, and then read that file using Fortran, and post-process that uh, text, uh, that new, that file from with all the data, and generate a plot3d file. So what do we need from the grip files? Well, for Leotex, all we need is the velocity data and the grid data. So uh, in the grid files, uh, the variables uh, that we need are velocity in the X, Y, and Z direction. And these are the labels uh, that um, they're given in the grid record uh, data. So I look for these and um, collect them, collect it all. Uh, the grid data, so this is the longitude, the latitude, and the height. But height is not really given. Literally, it's giving an it's given to us an altitude. So um, we get the longitude, latitude, and then the pressure levels. Um, once the data is extracted from the file, we post process the data using Fortran. Well, I've already said this. I don't know why it's here. OK, so, so um, here are some of the figures that I use, that I generated um, from uh, from the grip files. This is uh, the actual hurricane. Uh, this grip file is Arthur one and uh, numbers. Uh, so the grip file name for this is a grip file name for Hurricane Arthur. The date stamp is for July 2nd, 2014. So that's the data that I have. Uh, I think uh, some information about Hurricane Arthur, it was declared a tropical storm July 3rd, 2014. It hit North Carolina in the United States, and it was labeled as a category two hurricane, which means it is extremely dangerous when it has extremely dangerous winds and that it will cause extensive damage. And the velocity of the wind speeds are right there, which is kind of high. Uh, so here is one visualization uh, that I made using, um, this is all Leotex magnitude. We have a few slices going through the data. Uh, here's the longitude and the latitude. We see uh, the main uh, hurricane forming here uh, and then kind of just out here, uh, not out here. <laughs> uh, I, I do not know much about hurricanes. Uh, I was asked to produce these <laughs> figures. Uh, I am still learning, but this is pretty cool. You can see a lot of information 
uh, he he said these were great figures, and uh, he learned a lot. Here's a here's the top view using the Leotex magnitude. Um, you can kind of see it right here. There's a focus of of really high um, turbulence here, and then here's another angle of the same um, hurricane. Uh, another hurricane that happened. This one was a lot stronger. Uh, this is Hurricane Fabian. Fabian. Uh, it happened September 2nd, 2003. It hit Bermuda, which is an island in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it was a cat category four hurricane, which means that catastrophic damage will occur. And you can see how fast the wind speeds were for this uh, hurricane. And then here's a description of the hurricane. And this is an actual photograph of the hurricane from space. Um, yeah. Here's a figure that I generated uh, using the text magnitude. So we can see that uh, here's the hurricane. Here's another part of the hurricane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, here's another visualization, visual representation of the, the hurricane. You have very high strength uh, rotation right here. And, and we can see the relative uh, strength fading away. Uh, here's another picture i think that's all i have yeah thank you did you can issue out of something for the the off i did you did something i did something for really for tornado for tornado yeah i say oh uh, yeah 250 billion where's my mouse you you should have them now hold on this is not well, this is the uh, only issue of the power yeah i can show the few pictures but it is really very huge data yeah, the for um oh you don't, you, you don't I didn't bring the hard drive that has it. Uh I see you say it's on my other computer. I have a you, big you computer can, at home. Find it from email. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's from your email. You can find it. You, uh, you, you give the picture to him, right? Oh yeah, I think yeah. that's interesting because uh, uh, we really don't know the mechanism. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna look the, at my emails. Tornado. Yeah, this uh, caused the uh, uh, big damage in <laughs> you uh, know United States, uh, especially in the center, you know, middle uh, east, uh, Midwest. Yeah. So, uh, so you you give uh, I think this is very interesting. So uh, show block on that. Yeah. Show block on that. I'm you may search for send. Uh, Inbox is the receive, send is what it oh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. these are that's the uh, data files that I processed and the names. Well you send the, the yeah. yeah, so here are some figures of his. He has a really, really high resolution. And, and do you see the tornado? What extraction? Yeah, <laughs> so this is a tornado. Yeah. Uh, he. This is a really high resolution grid. Uh, I forgot, this is the really, really big one in here. 250 billion. Yeah, 250 yeah, billion. 10 meters. And then uh, <laughs> this is the figures that came up from it. I just put a few really very high rotation strength up here. Uh, but uh, the problem is they don't know when and where this tornado happened. Sometimes uh, you, know, you you particularly happen, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, yeah, you didn't, they happen. Mm -hmm. So they want to get the mechanism when and why it happens. So that's the work experience. But well, that's a way higher resolution. Yeah. So how many slices do you have in this data in the vertical direction? So his data is different. So uh, with uh, the presentation that I just gave, that was uh, using grid files. Yeah. This is what this came from a completely different format. I think he used a, a like a net CDF file type. Is that the numerical? Yeah. So it. So, yeah, so it's like it's grid points, like uh, X, Y, Z grid points, not really longitude, latitude thing. They are the real world. We collect data from the real. Yeah. Oh yeah. The 
Yeah, so this is simulated, right? Is this simulated? Yeah. Yes, he simulated this. And then Yeah, this is simulated data and then the other data was experimental from the satellite. So this is a simulation and then the other ones um is experiment. Experimental, yeah. So how accurate is that data? I don't even know how they acquire that close velocities like from the satellite. They like use how <laughs> satellites are really cool and they kind of use a I think they use different wavelengths and whatever gets reflected back uh the strength of what gets reflected back they use crazy stuff uh also sonar I think yeah, some it's Doppler then, right right so yeah, yeah, yeah. they also like Rita yeah. go get planes and fly through the hurricane as it's forming and they have uh sonar that collects data as it's flying by okay. Yeah. But then um, how accurate you need it to be for like the LUTEX, for instance, to work nicely. Like like for instance, I I, I don't know, like I don't know anything about hurricanes or anything like yeah. that. But you it's kind of you see like a rock a, yeah. you know, rotating like this, but mm -hmm. like I would imagine that you would get one axis. Right. And you get got several. Right. Mm -hmm. And and true, maybe on the side there's something else going on. But mm -hmm. like the main thing, I don't know, I would have expected one right. axis. So, so uh the research that he's doing is he's looking at the smaller vortices yeah. within the large hurricane. Mm -hmm. So he's saying like he's looking at to see how um uh small ones can combine. Uh, and uh, what happens after they combine, uh, and he's trying to observe stuff with that. I don't know exactly what he wants to do with that, but um, that's what he's trying to look at. But it's supposed to have like several axes. Yes, uh, because vortex and merge. Yeah, right. Because same rotation, correct? They merge. Yeah, yeah. A lot of small, you know, vortices. They combine that become a, a large. I see. So that's re the really they say uh, inside vortex a lot of vortex. Mm -hmm. The large world is a vortex that was small, smaller, smaller. <laughs> but really true. There's a lot of yeah, small vortex. Same as the interest of how to form the large mm -hmm. vortex by these small vortexes. So that's that interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. We need to find a mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess by you looking at the smaller ones, you could find it earlier on whether or not it's going to form mm -hmm. or something. Uh, if he if he finds which ones collide with which ones and what they're doing when that's happening, then he could see like, hey, uh, this is happening here in this part of the world. Uh, there mm -hmm. could be potential for a hurricane or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Hurricane scientists from the online people. Oh, do they have any questions? No, I not not valid. I don't think. <laughs> okay. Then we go to the last talk, right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Thank you again <laughs> for your. And, uh, uh, we will uh, give to our last uh, presentation. It, it, it is supposed to be uh, presented by uh, Chen Xima, but he has a fine conflicting. He, he has a final today, so he re records the video and I will uh, play the video. You need it. Oh. It's a mathematical uh, headache. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a mathematical, but it's a Chen Xima. The fact is more mathematical. But uh, I don't know what he is doing. But, uh, <laughs> but he's not here anyway. He has the final exam tomorrow. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 there's a nice talk today. Uh, okay. Okay. Include it. It does not let me include computer sound. What's the problem? You need to get permission. 
go to your device audio settings, select sharp uh, HDMI. Okay. Okay, you need uh, also need the recording there. Device uh, setting, yeah, uh, so HDMI, you need the audio, audio. You need the audio, yeah. Yeah. audio is reset. Oh, this one? Okay. Yeah. Allow, allow. Yeah. Okay, and... Uh, of Texas at Arlington, Department of Mathematics. Mm -hmm. Today I'm going to talk about the uniform decomposition of velocity gradient tensor. First, I'm going to introduce some background knowledge, and then I'm going to talk about the principal decomposition and the three different cases. After that, I will explain why we refer this as a uniform decomposition, how these three different cases are related to each other, and the conclusion after that. First, what is velocity gradient tensor? Velocity gradient tensor is related to the acceleration of a particle dv over dt which can be derived from the material derivative formula as shown here. And here the matrix in red is the velocity gradient tensor, nabla v. The principal decomposition has three steps. First, we transform the nabla v from XYZ system into the principal PQR system by using the orthogonal matrix U. And under the principal system, we can easily decompose it into three different terms. And then we transform each term back into the original XYZ system by using the same matrix. Here, the orthogonal matrix U is composed by three orthonormal vectors, P, Q, R. And for being orthogonal, U transpose equals to U inverse, and the determinant of U has to be 1. Nebula V can be classified into three different cases according to its discriminant delta. If delta is negative, then it only has one real eigenvalue, which is referred as lambda r. It also has two conjugate complex eigenvalues, which are referred as lambda cr plus or minus i lambda ci. If delta is equal to zero, then it only has one or two distinct real eigenvalues, which are referred as lambda 1 and lambda 2, or just lambda. When delta is positive, it has totally three distinct real eigenvalues, which are referred as lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. For the first case, this type of points are also referred as rotational points, and for the second and the third case, they are also called non-rotational points. Now let's look at the first case, when lambda is less than zero. The layout of the principal matrix looks like this. To make partial u over partial z, partial v over partial z to be zero under the principal coordinate rate system, we require r equals to rx, ry, rz to be a unit eigenvector of nebula v with respect to the real eigenvalue from the r. And we also require that omega dot r is positive. Here, capital R is omega dot r minus square root of omega dot r square minus 4 lambda ci square is the magnitude of lutex. This formula has been proven in many previous papers, but now let's look at how do we derive it. First, we start from this vorticity matrix, which can be obtained from nebula V minus its transpose. If we transform this matrix into PQR system, then we can find it should equal to uh, the principal matrix minus its transpose. And thus, we can get the following equation. And after we multiply what we got from the left-hand side, it should equal to what we got on the right-hand side. And thus, we can solve that r plus epsilon equals to omega dot r, c equals to negative omega dot q, and eta equals to omega dot p. And since pqr is the coordinate rate vectors, we can find omega equals to omega dot p times p, 
plus omega dot q times q plus omega dot r times r, which equals to eta p minus cosy q plus epsilon r plus r times r. The first three terms is the shear, and the last one is the lutex vector. So the shear plus the rotation is the vorticity. Since r plus epsilon equals to omega dot r, partial v over partial x, under the principal system, which is epsilon plus r over 2, should equal to omega dot r minus r over 2. And also, changing between different coordinate systems doesn't affect the value of the determinant. We have the determinant of the principal matrix should equal to the product of all three eigenvalues. And after simplify it, we got a quadratic equation for r over 2. And we can solve that r equals to omega dot r plus or minus square root of omega dot r square minus 4 lambda c i square. Since there is no rotation when lambda c i equals to 0, we thus get the formula for the lutex magnitude. The principal matrix can be decomposed into three parts. The diagonal term is the stretching or compression. The anti-symmetric matrix stands for rotation, and the lower triangular neopotent matrix stands for the shear. For stretching and compression, we can use the following equation to bring it back into the original system, which equals to lambda CR times identity matrix plus lambda R minus lambda CR times R times R transpose. Here, R times R transpose is a 3 by 3 matrix. For the rotation term, we can bring it back into the original system as follows. Here, Rx, Ry, Rz stand for the three components of the lutex vector R. And for the shear, we can obtain it by subtracting rotation and uh, stretching or compression from the original velocity gradient tensor, nebula V. And it can be expressed as follows. Now let's look at the second case. When delta equals to zero, we have repeated real eigenvalues. For this case, we are basically using a modified Schwarz decomposition. First, suppose we have two distinct eigenvalues, then one of them must have a generalized eigenspace with dimension 2, which is referred as lambda 2, and that of the other one must have dimension 1, which is referred as lambda 1. To obtain lambda 1 at the partial w over partial z location and the principal system, we require r equals to rx, ry, rz still be a unit eigenvector of nebula v with respect to lambda 1. We also require omega dot r to be positive. The decomposition for the principal matrix under this case will be a diagonal matrix for the stretching L compression term and the still epsilon gussie eta, the lower triangular matrix for the shear term. For stretching or compression, we can bring it back into the original system by using the same formula. And for the shear, we can still obtain it by subtracting stretching or compression from nebula V as shows here. Suppose we only have one real eigenvalue, say lambda, then the decomposition will be much easier. The stretching compression term will just be lambda i, and the shear term will just be nebula v subtract lambda i. Now let's look at the third case. But before that, we need to define a new fluid tensor, a symmetric matrix called resistance L, to explain why non-rotational points can have vorticity but without having rotation. Due to the existence of resistance, once the non-rotational point is imposed by a rotation term, an anti-symmetric matrix, 
the resistance will just be consumed and combined with the anti-symmetric matrix and convert into shear. Once the resistance is depleted, it will be converted into the second case we just talked about. The resistance is also the minimum amount of rotation we need to impose on this point to make it into the second case which is about to rotate. Thus, due to the bucket effect, we will choose the eigenvector on which direction the resistance is the weakest as our principal axis R. And that is because on that direction, the rotation is most likely to occur. Now let's look at the decomposition for this case. As you can see, the principal matrix looks very similar to the first case, but instead of negative R over 2, we have L over 2 at partial U over partial Y location. So we have a symmetric L over 2, L over 2 for partial U over partial Y, partial V over partial X, instead of an uh, anti-symmetric negative R over 2 at R over 2. Also, to make partial u over partial z and partial v over partial z to be zero, we still require r to be a unit eigenvector of nebula v with respect to lambda 3, and we still require omega dot r to be positive. Here, l can be calculated by the following equation. l equals to square root of omega dot r squared plus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 squared minus omega dot r. Now let's look at how do we derive this formula. We can use the same vorticity matrix that we used before. However, instead of r plus epsilon equals to omega dot r, we only have epsilon equals to omega dot r, and c equals to negative omega dot q, and eta equals to omega dot p. So from here, we can obtain that omega equals to eta p minus cosec q plus epsilon r, which equals to shear. So instead of vorticity, is the combination of rotation and shear. Here we only have vorticity is shear. This is easy to understand because for non-rotational point, rotation is zero. So vorticity is just shear. And again, we can use the preserve of the determinant value between two different systems. We have lambda 1 times lambda 2 times lambda 3 equals to the determinant of the principal matrix. And after simplify, we got a quadratic equation for L. And we can solve L equals to negative epsilon plus or minus square root of epsilon plus square of lambda 1 minus lambda 2. And uh, since there should not be rotation, where well, lambda 1 equals to lambda 2 for the second case, and we got the formula for L. The resistance L equals to square root omega dot R square plus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 square minus omega dot R. Now let's look at the decomposition for this case. Again, we take out the diagonal matrix lambda 1 plus lambda 2 over 2, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 over 2, lambda 3 for stretching or compression. The lower triangular matrix is again the shear, epsilon, c, and eta. And here is our new tensor, the resistance, which is a symmetric matrix with L over 2 and L over 2 for partial u over partial y and partial v over partial x. Before we talk about how to bring each term back into the original system, here are some preparation work we need to do. First, we need to find the principal axis. As I just said before, the principal axis is on which direction the resistance is the weakest. So we need to calculate the resistance at all three eigenvector direction to find which one is the minimum by using the following equation. Here vi is the eigenvector and lambda j, lambda k stand for the other two eigenvalues. After we find on which direction the resistance is the minimum, 
the eigenvector is referred as r equals to rx ry rz the corresponding eigenvalue will be referred as lambda 3 and the resistance at that direction is the resistance we need and the second step is to find p and the q first we define n of v as a normalized function n of v equals to v over v norm and v1 v2 are the projection of the other two eigenvectors onto the plane which is orthogonal to the principal axis r and uh, q0 will be the bisector of v1 prime and v2 prime so it can be calculated as n of n of v1 prime plus n of v2 prime and uh, we can find p0 by using the cross product as q cross r <coughs> however using bisector alone will cause a problem that totally we have four choices of q and the two of them will give us the principal matrix we want and the other two will change the location between L over 2 and Y plus L over 2. What we want is Y plus L over 2 as partial V over partial X and L over 2 as partial U over partial Y. So we can use nebula V of Q0 dot product with P0 to check the value for partial u over partial y. If it does not equals to l over 2, it means it equals to y plus l over 2. Then we need to change p into q and q into p and make one of them to be negative. Or otherwise, this p and q is the correct p and q we want. Now we can start to bring each term back into the original XYZ system. For the stretching or compression, we can use the same method again. It equals to lambda 1 plus lambda 2 over 2 at times identity matrix I plus lambda 3 minus lambda 1 plus lambda 2 over 2 times R R transpose. <coughs> The resistance L can be calculated as L over 2 times Q P transpose plus P Q transpose. And the shear can be obtained by subtraction, stretching or compression, and resistance from nebula B. Now let's look at a little summary for the decomposition we just talked about. For all three cases, it can be decomposed into three parts. Stretching or compression, rotation of resistance, and the shear. For stretching or compression, it is the diagonal from the principal matrix, which has the same trace as nebula B, and after transformed back into the original system, it is still symmetric. The shear is just the y, xi, and eta of the lower triangular, and uh, after transformed into the XYZ system, it remains to be neopotent. For a rotational point, it has an anti-symmetric matrix for rotation, which is r over 2 and negative r over 2 for partial v over partial x and partial u over partial y. For non-rotational point, we have a resistance term, which is l over 2 and l over 2 for partial v over partial x and partial u over partial y. And for the second case, which is at the edge of rotation and non-rotation, we have a zero matrix, which can be referred as both symmetric and anti-symmetric. For all three cases, the rotation or resistance are symmetric or anti-symmetric, and uh, its trace and determinant are both zero. Now let's look at how the resistance keep the non-rotational point or remain non-rotational. Once a non-rotational point is imposed by an anti-symmetric matrix A negative A for some A less than L over 2, the resistance will be reduced into L minus 2A, and the Y will be increased into Y plus 2A. We refer the new resistance as L prime and the new uh, Y as Y prime. 
then we can keep the principal matrix as the same form, only L changing into L prime and epsilon changing into epsilon prime. If we impose a stronger rotation on this non-rotational point, say L over 2, negative L over 2, then the whole resistance will be deplete and uh, it will be converted into the second case with lambda 1 plus lambda 2 over 2 as the new lambda 2 and uh, lambda 3 as the new lambda 1 and epsilon plus L as the new epsilon. And if we keep imposing a anti-symmetric matrix upon it, say R over 2, negative R over 2, then it will be converted into the third case and start to rotate. The lambda 2 will be the lambda CR, and the lambda 1 will be the lambda R. Another reason why we refer this decomposition as uniform decomposition is because the negative resistance has the same formula as Lutex. If we plug in lambda 1, lambda 2 as the two complex conjugate eigenvalues, lambda CR plus or minus I lambda CI, then lambda 1 minus lambda 2 squared will be negative for lambda CI squared. And uh, the formula for negative L will become omega dot R minus square root of omega dot R squared minus 4 lambda CI squared, which is exactly the same as lutex magnitude. And of course, one lambda 1 equals to lambda 2 for the second case, both the negative resistance and lutex are zero. So we can use negative L as a uniform parameter for both the rotational and non-rotational point. If the value is negative, it stands for the negative resistance for non-rotational point. If the value is positive, it stands for the lutex for rotational point. Here, let's look at some contour plot from our DNS data. The value is negative L, which we just talked about. The red part stands for the lutex magnitude, and it is positive. And the blue part are negative, stands for negative resistance for non-rotational point. The negative value do not stand for rotation on the opposite direction. It means how strong a rotation we need to impose on this non-rotational point to convert it into the second case, which is about to rotate. These four slides came from turbulent region with large x value. As we can see, there are a lot of vertices in red appear between 0 to 20. And above that, it is the average flow with almost a zero velocity gradient. And we can also find resistance show up between those vertices. This pattern makes us wondering how the resistance is generated. So we go back to check the data from the earlier stage of the flow. As we can see from the third picture on the left, when the flow is laminar enough, there are only a few vertices show up at the bottom. And when two vertices are close enough to each other, the resistance is generated between them. And as the flow became more and more turbulent, more and more vertices showed up, and the distance between them became closer and closer. And meanwhile, the resistance between them also increases in magnitude. From here, we can make a hypothesis that the resistance is generated between vertices by the balance of vertices with different rotation direction. And at last, the conclusion. Velocity gradient tensor in all three cases can be decomposed into three terms, stretching or compression, shear, and rotation or resistance. 
In this talk, we develop a new uniform parameter for all velocity gradient tensor, negative L. It appears as positive values for rotational point as lutex magnitude, and it appears as negative value for non-rotational point as the negative resistance. From our DNS data, we may think that the resistance is generated between vertices due to the balance of the different rotation direction. And that is all I want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think thank you. I see my join our uh, online meeting. I see. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see yeah. I'm here. I'm here. So, <laughs> so okay. Yeah. So, thank you for staying up late. I know in Texas it's it's maybe two o'clock. Almost two. Yeah, almost two. <laughs> two o'clock. Yeah. Appreciate. It. And uh, okay, since he is online, so if you have any questions, you can directly communicate with him. That's okay. You don't mind if I talk. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. But the, the original yeah, our idea is, you know, the mutex is rotation, but the, the in the full field, not every point is rotation. Mm -hmm. Some point is rotation, some are not. That could be the function. This could be not the differential, even this you know continuous. So. Actually, we it's hard to uh, derive the transport equation because it don't have derivative in some area. Uh, but uh, then we talk to uh, Chen Xi and uh, say, well, can you find the, the you know, uniform <laughs> decomposition for everyone? Everyone. And said, no matter that it's not good. But he did. Well, I think it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. even when he had a lot of mathematics. Mar Mar so, but uh, this is science. so. Uh, he really give every point. So, uh, I, you know, I Different. universal, yeah. yeah, decomposition, no matter who they along with it. So he just divide a new, instead of new term, he divide the L. Mm -hmm. The L could be rotated or could be no rotated. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's, I say. That is the idea. And sounds to me is written and very, very good. But anyway, the mathematics is headache. Mm -hmm. People already had it with the new text, but now it's more mm -hmm. right? But uh, well, the, the final formula is not very complicated, right? My understanding, your final formula sounds to me uh, it is straightforward. Yeah. Really, we don't we don't need a P on the Q. We still just need an R. That's the important, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. The, the final, the final, I think, yeah. I, I believe, yeah, the final, this is really, they only need a, a formula for L. So also only need for R. R is the same as a new type, but now it's not rotation. It still need R, need a one R. So R is a really eigenvector. It's still eigenvector. So that's the easy idea. I think uh, yeah, even the, uh, you know, the derivation is way uh, pretty complicated and headache. The, Final results is not that bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any, any, any question? Nobody have question? Are you in the online? No? no? They have a question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, then mm -hmm. she's here. No. You're welcome to give a question to, uh, to him. <laughs> He's a good at math. <laughs> He's a good at math. He's an, actually a new PhD. <laughs> That's the second year, right? Yeah, that's the second year. You and you yes. And the second year, the second year. It sounds to me, yeah. Could it be <laughs> a new idea for the fluid kinematics, I think? Yeah. Universal. Mm -hmm. No question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if there is no question, I, I think uh, we talk about tomorrow. But tomorrow, yeah, you are leaving, right? Yeah. And uh, you will see it here. But I don't think we need to come here. First, the, you online, all the talk online, you only need uh, just a like, loud stay in your, your 
own new place. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, yeah, we, we just say bye for, for today and for the work, workshop, right? And I hope, yeah, if we and, uh, uh, you know, Oscar can control the, we still use team. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you guys too. You even don't need to come here, it's their own. Okay. Uh, so I, I just link, I link. Uh, you, uh, well, the Dr. Wang is the chairman. So he will, you know, uh, monitor and manage the online speed, but uh, controlled by, you know, uh, we, we, uh, by the UTS, so we use a team, uh, MS team, right, uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. team. So you two guys are responsible mm -hmm. for the team. So Dr. Wang is responsible for managing all the talk and discussion. And we just say uh, uh, to Dr. Shi, <laughs> uh, bye for your, your coming. Very nice, uh, very, very good job. And uh, Dr. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, Kaduro, so uh, yeah, also feel very you know, nice job about the uh, you know, transition, not only to transition, more, much more, including the experiment work I saw that. So thank you for this uh, in my philosophy. So that's uh, just uh, uh, we say bye for yeah, and I uh, hope you have good sleep. It's too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you attention too far. We are almost twelve. Yeah, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. So we keep in touch anyway. Yeah, by by email online or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, hope you can join the uh, you know online you, you know uh, presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably join on Wednesday. Oh, and, uh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. And so, uh, that's another very uh, quite a number for a lot of uh, good talks, uh, online talks. Uh, they cannot come here because uh, some people, because of visa problem, you know, some people have a cost, a budget problem. So, uh, it's all the way up about uh, almost 20, I think. Should be 20 people to speak so nice. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. okay. We just say uh, good night, and we will take care of this okay. space. Thank so, you. so yeah, thank you. You have any, any, any thank, thank you, oh, everyone. Yeah. Appreciate your no, no, attendance. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So we we finish now. Oh, oh, oh. We don't have any before you. Uh, no, no, no.